turned on. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? I think so. Are you all awake now that we've had coffee? Great, because we're going to actually require some input from you in this talk. We are going to be looking for planets. Isn't it exciting? I'm so going to get this wrong. <laughs> okay, so this is a, 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 an introductory talk to, uh, talk about uh, tran the transit method. And throughout the day, we are actually going to have several more talks about the transit method and in particular about transit validation uh, later on in the afternoon. And we've got the workshops, uh, the hands-on session set up as well. So this talk is really to give you a broad overview of um, what happens from the initial transit detection to uh, of something that could be a planet to, oh, this is uh, confirmed or validated as a planet. Actually, I'm only going to talk about transit uh, planet confirmation, and Tim Morton and Andrew Vandenberg this afternoon are going to talk about validation. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. Basically, uh, I'm just going to very briefly uh, mention uh, basically transit basics and what is the transit method, and uh, show you some of the discoveries that we've made with the transit method so far, because there are thousands of exoplanets that have been found, uh, particularly by Kepler, and it's, it's just super exciting results. We're starting to learn about the populations of planets that are out there. And so I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of that. And then uh, we'll go through uh, the ver some of the steps involved from uh, transit detection to confirmation of a planet. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of things that you should watch out for when uh, you, so we have a confirmed planet and we're characterizing it at this point using transit data. And uh, stellar activity can mess up your planet parameters. And also, uh, you need to know your star so that you can know your planet. Because remember that at the end of the day, we're really, we're looking at stars that are so far away, right? We can't even see them with the naked eye, many of them. Uh, they're really, really faint. But the planet next to it is, is way, way more fainter. Right. And the analogy I like to have in my head is that you're looking for a mosquito that is flying in front of a set of headlights of a car at the end of two football pitches. Okay, so we're looking for something really small. And all you can really see is those headlights. You can't actually see the mosquito. So everything you're going to learn about the mosquito, you're going to be doing it through learning about the headlights. So you need to know your star to know your planet. And I think this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this week. Right, okay, so uh, what's the transit method? Uh, basically, you're looking at a star, and uh, if you're really lucky, you have a planet that passes in front of it. And as the planet goes in front, we observe the light. The light goes down as a function of time, and so that's the transit. And the uh, planet will continue its, in its orbit and come back, and so the recurrence rate at which it comes back and at which you get this transit gives you the orbital period of the planet. You can also see that the, the transit has this um, rounded shape. That's because of the limb darkening of the star, so the uh, geometrical effects and the fact that the atmosphere of the star has different opacities in different places. And uh, this is the transit depth. So it tells you uh, how big the, well, it's the ratio of the star's uh, the, planet the planet radius uh, ratioed with the star radius, uh, stellar radius. So it's RP over R star square. So it tells you how big the planet is. And so, for example, for a Jupiter-sized planet, uh, you're going to have a dip of about 1%. And that is observable from the ground. We have many ground-based surveys. Uh, Tim Morton's going to be telling us about uh, different surveys this afternoon. And so the many uh, Jupiter-sized planets have been found from the ground. But if you want to find an Earth-sized planet, that's 84 parts per million. So that's quite a bit smaller. And for that, you need to go to space. So that's why we sent Kepler, we had Toro. Um, and we'll be, uh, I'll show you an example of uh, an Earth-sized planet in Kepler data in a bit. Right. And so also, I'd like to point out that because of this ratio, uh, you're going to have, if you're looking for very small planets, one thing you can do is look at very small stars because the relative dip is going to be bigger. So you're, looking, you're going to be looking for a bigger signature. 
Right next, we've got transit duration. So that's just the width of that transit. And it's proportional to R star over A, uh, the whole thing squared. And so just to give you an idea of numbers, for Jupiter, it would be 30 hours. So Jupiter takes 30 hours to go to transit the sun uh, if you're a distant observer. And the Earth, would, it would take about three hours for that observer to see Earth transiting the sun. Uh, and because it depends on A, uh, the semi-major uh, axis, so the orbital uh, distance at which the planet is from the star, a hot Jupiter, it would take about two and a half hours. So that just kind of gives you an idea of if you're going to be observing a transit, uh, say of your hot Jupiter with uh, some telescope on the ground um, or anywhere really, uh, you want to be able to observe it for around about that amount of time. It's gonna take more than five minutes, basically. Right. And next, uh, I would just like to, I'm not gonna go through all the math, but uh, just to give you an idea of what is the probability that a planet would transit a star, given that you're looking at it uh, from any direction. So we have uh, the star in the middle here, and that's a celestial sphere. And basically the planet is in its orbit. So that's just a zoomed in version. And so you see the planet going around at semi-major axis A. And so that blue area is the shadow that is projected uh, from the planet, uh, the star's light gets blocked in that cone of light. And so and as, as an observer, what's the probability that you're gonna be standing just in that area where you get the planet's transit? So um, basically you need uh, this distance to be less equal or less than r star minus radius of the planet. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, cool. We can see ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone know what the probability roughly of, of an Earth transiting its star at one AU is. Don't be shy. Values, is it is it like ten percent? One percent? Yeah? Half a percent, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's very small. And if it was Jupiter transiting the sun from five AU, how much how much smaller would that be? it would be 0.05%. So you're getting into really small numbers. And so the idea is that you have to observe thousands of stars if you're going to be able to catch a transit at any given time. Sorry, can you go back? That's great. <laughs> All right, so this is where we were. I'm still trying to figure out how to use the pointer, sorry. And yeah, so basically, the probability is proportional to R star over A. And the implication of that, so here are some, some numbers, uh, as we were just saying. Uh, thank you for um, your giving some uh, very accurate answers. So for an Earth, uh, well, it doesn't matter actually uh, what the radius of the planet is, but how distant it is from its star and how big the star is. And so for an Earth in a 1AU, for a planet in a 1AU orbit, it would be about 0.5%. And it goes down more and more as you go out, go out to further uh, orbits as is intuitive. And so uh, the takeaways are that yes, we need to survey thousands or millions, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of stars to be able to find transits. And uh, we also uh, will find more planets around stars that have larger, um, around larger parent stars. So that might be a bias that you might want to take into account when uh, you're doing your population studies, for example. So uh, just a little brief uh, mention of uh, all the planet discoveries that we've made so far using the transit method. So I've got over about 3,000 transiting planets confirmed up here, but this is just transiting planets, so there are actually more. And I don't think it counts for the um, candidates, though it does count for the validated planets. And basically, um, as you can see, 
well, so we've got planet radius as a function of the year of discovery. So we're here. And up there, the first planets that we found were Jupiter-sized planets because they were easier to find. And they could be found from the ground. So over here, you had all the ground-based surveys. And then uh, we had Coro, the Coro uh, spacecraft that found Coro 7b, which was the first planet that had a radius that is about one and a half times the uh, size of the Earth radius. And so that was very exciting. And then from there on, uh, Kepler came online and we found all of these small planets. And so just for reference, we've got Jupiter up there and then Neptune and Earth. And Kepler 37b is actually a Mercury-sized planet. Isn't that cool? Uh, and so we've got two populations, two kinds of populations emerging uh, that we don't really have in our solar system, right? We don't have sub-Neptune planets in the solar system. Uh, and there are also uh, super Earths. And so these, this is the, the radius range. So they're, oops, sorry. Yes, I knew I was going to get this wrong at some point. So uh, the super Earths are about one to two Earth radii. And then the sub Neptunes are everything above that uh, that is less than Neptune's radius. And actually, recent results, which I'm going to show you now, uh, the results that came out last year uh, that were published by uh, BJ Fulton, who I'm not sure, I don't think he's here today, uh, but he's, he's actually a grad student. So he's just like most of you guys, right? And I think this is tremendously exciting because exoplanets is such a fast growing field that you can actually make some very exciting discoveries from the very beginning that you get into this field, right? And so he found that he took all the Kepler results and measured uh, the stellar parameters of the host stars better, more precisely and more accurately. And he found this plot, he made this plot, so it's orbital period. Note that it goes from about one to 100 days because Kepler found, most of the planets that Kepler found were within 80 days because it was a four year mission. And uh, just uh, planet radius on the y-axis. And he plotted the relative occurrence, so the occurrence rate of these kinds of planets. And so this is what he gets. So all the points are the individual planets, and then he's got the occurrence rate over plotted. And so what you can really see that is, is super exciting, is you've got this gap here, right? And this is actually the sub-Neptunes and the super-Earth that I was telling you about in the previous slide. And further work by uh, people who are more on the theory side uh, have found that they, they think that this is actually, um, this is not just a coincidence, this is not just from observational bias. This is explained by models of formation and evolution of planets. So this is where the observations are really starting to feed in to some really exciting models for planetary formation and evolution. And so we call this the uh, evaporation valley. And then over here, you may have noticed that you don't get any small, um, any large, highly irradiated planets, and we call that the evaporation desert. And so you can uh, refer to newspapers for, uh, uh, to find out more details about the theories. Right. So now that we've seen all these really exciting results, hopefully you're very excited about the transit method. And we're about to get into the uh, maybe Less fun, well, still very fun because we're going to find our own planets, but, but it's, it's actually, it takes a lot of work to confirm a planet. And there are many steps involved from detection to figuring out if it's a planet and then following it up, getting the parameters and confirming it as a planet. And so we're going to go through a few of these steps. Um, I, next, okay, I got confused again, but yes, we're, next we're going to talk about uh, a transit detection algorithm, the box least squares uh, fitting model. And then uh, I'm going to ignore all this part about, so we find planet candidates and then we can either look at them by eye, this is what we're going to do today, or we can statistically validate them. And so I refer to Tim and Andrew's talk this afternoon for that and the workshop um, on Vespa. Uh, and then basically we can try to decide whether they are astrophysical false positives, which we're going to be talking about, or if they are uh, actual planets. 
and maybe in that process you're going to need oh oh is it still not streaming Right, okay. So we will, we do some eyeballing. So looking at the light curves by eye, we're gonna do some of that. And then depending on what comes out of this, you might wanna take more observations, uh, maybe more photometry uh, to get another transit, to see the shape of the transit more clearly. Uh, maybe you're going to want to do uh, reconnaissance spectroscopy to measure the stellar parameters of the host. Uh, more precisely and more accurately. Uh, maybe you're going to want to take an image uh, using maybe speckle interferometry, lucky imaging, or adaptive optics imaging to um, see if, if you're just looking at one star or if actually there's another star in the background or right next to it, and that's what's creating your transit-like signal. Okay, and then also after you're sure of, after you pass all these tests, for your planet candidate, you might want to move on to uh, radio velocity monitoring to measure the mass of the planet and to confirm it independently from the transit. Uh, and we're going to be uh, having lots of talks about this tomorrow, so I'm not gonna talk about this. And then at the end, I'll just talk briefly about uh, what we do once we've gone through all these steps and we have a confirmed planet, how do we characterize it? Right, so let's just move on to how can we find something that has the shape of a transit in a lot of photometric data? So this is a, I'm only gonna talk about one technique, but there are many. I've got lots of references on the slides, so you can always go back and look at them. Uh, but this is the most basic one, and hopefully the one that's going to uh, give you an insight into how it's done. So basically, uh, we have this transit, and this transit is described by 10 parameters, many of which are nonlinear. So it's actually quite a complicated problem, right? Um, and what the box uh, least squares, the BLS does, is it takes this problem and it fits the box. And by doing that, okay, it's a gross approximation, right? That transit doesn't look like this. And this is a sketch, so it doesn't even look like a real transit. But what you're doing is that you're taking your 10 parameter problem and making it into something that is much more manageable. So now we've only got three nonlinear parameters. So the period, the orbital period, the uh, time of periastron, so that's just the phase of your, of your transit in the orbit and the width, and two linear parameters. So the two linear parameters are just um, the baseline flux level and the depth of the transit. And what we do is at each so we take each of our nonlinear parameters and we step through a grid for each of them. So say I'm going to take the period and I'm gonna have a grid of periods ranging from a day to a hundred days and I'm gonna take steps. And at each step, I'm going to step in uh, the phase and I'm also gonna step in the width. And, but at each step uh, of these uh, three parameters, we're going to fit for uh, basically the, the depth and the, ba the flux base level. And when we do that fit, we're going to optimize the chi-square. So when you do this, you might get, so if you look at the grid in orbital periods, for example, this is what I've plotted here, uh, real data coming up in the next slide, but basically you've got your periods and you're, minim you're looking at the chi-square at each period. And so at one point, you might find that you get a much better chi-square. So you, what we're trying to do is minimize the chi-square here. And so this, this might be a transit-like signal at this orbital period, right? So let's just have a look at what this looks like in, in real data. So this is a super uh, light curve on the left. And uh, it's, so this, these are the actual data. Uh, it's a ground-based survey, so there's a lot of points and there's a lot of um, data. And it's 
phase bin is binned in phase, phase folded over at the signal at which this uh, BLS periodogram, so you've got the chi-square again, and as a function of period, and when we ran the BLS, this is what the supervised algorithm does, it returns the BLS, and so here you find that you've got this very good signal, the very strong signal here. And so that's the period over which it's phased, and you can see you've got a little dip here. The blue line is the, um, they've been the data just so that it looks cleaner, and it looks, they've just shifted it up so that you just for um, plotting purposes, but you can see the shape of the transit a little bit better. And the reason I'm showing uh, this works like uh, Kepler data is coming up in a minute. I know you're all really excited to see Kepler data, but one of the strengths of the BLS method is that it can work, it does work for unevenly sampled data and sparsely sampled data. So it works for ground-based sur surveys. Um, and another thing I would like to say is that, uh, so it is a, a simple method uh, and it does, so a couple of limitations. One is that it will not take into account the window function effect. So for example, in this particular case, uh, this peak actually turns out, this actually turns out to be a planet. Uh, and it, this is the, the true period of that planet. But in many cases, you have to go and look at the nth highest peak. So you can see that this is twice the period, three times, uh, and there's P over two here. And so it's not clear often which peak is the true peak because of the window function effect. All right, so this is somewhere where you're going to have to uh, use your own judgment to make that call. The statistics are not gonna tell you that. And another thing is, uh, if you remember the previous slide, I said that we're minimizing the chi-square. So this is an uncorrelated noise um, framework. And so, if there is correlated noise, that can mess up your BLS. So for example, I'm gonna talk about stellar activity later. That's one kind of time dependent correlated noise. It, the activity of the star changes the baseline flux. So this might look very different and in a correlated manner. And you might also have some instrumental systematics as well. Right, and uh, there are other techniques so Kepler uses the transiting planet search. Uh, it's uh, similar to the BLS, but it uses uh, more um, elaborate methods. And so there are other techniques. I just list them here. But the idea was just to, to get the idea of the concept of how we do this. So now, here comes the really fun part. Oh, no. <laughs> well, yes, actually, this is one of my favorite slides because so in, in this BLS method that I've explained to you, uh, you may have noticed that you actually, you need several transits for this to work, right? You need at least two transits and probably three. And one of the things is, is that you don't always have several transits. And so for example, here, these are all planets that, uh, they're from the Kepler data, so they're Kepler planets. And they were found with the single transit they were actually found by the planet hunters uh, people uh, online who go through painstakingly every light curve and they look for everything that might look like a transit. So there's a lot of eyeballing that goes in that. Uh, there are also some um, machine learning algorithms that have been developed. Uh, so Jason Dittman has done a lot of work uh, with Mars to develop some neural networks that will find single transits. And Dan Foreman Mackey also has uh, used machine learning. So I refer you to those papers uh, if you're interested. But you, you should be interested because, uh, well, we don't know the period, but then we can find it with follow up. And this is going to be super relevant for tests because uh, you may or may not have seen this figure before, but it shows you the um, sky coverage of tests. And what you see is that most of the sky is observed in these blue bands, which only get about a month at a time of coverage. So if you're restricting yourself to finding planets that transit only, uh, that transit at least twice or three times, then you're going to be missing out a lot of planets from tests, right? And in fact, um, Steve Villanova and co-authors have found uh, that this is a really exciting result, I think. 
because they took the um, synthetic results uh, expected from uh, simulations of the test outcomes, and they find that the number of planets detected by tests with orbital periods greater than 25 days is going to be doubled. So if you consider trans single transits, you're going to find twice as many planets. And over 250 days, we're going to find 10 times more planets. So it's going to be really important that we focus on, on developing techniques uh, and to find these single transits. And uh, actually, Helen Giles here has a poster on um, a planet that she found with a single transit. So I would encourage you to go and speak to Helen if you have any questions about how to find single transit planets. Great. So let's go back to the many transiting planets, uh, the many transit planet system. And now we're going to do some human vetting. So I've got some uh, Kepler data and in it, we are obviously looking for this perfect scenario where you have a star and something goes in front of it that makes a transit and it's a planet. And that's what we're all looking for, right? Uh, but actually there are many scenarios in nature that can produce the same kind of transit or very slightly different transits. And so for example, you have a grazing stellar binary. So basically two stars and one of the stars is transiting the other, but it's doing so just on the edge so you're not actually getting a very deep transit. So it looks pretty convincing as you're going to see in the next slide. And you can also have systems where uh, you have a transiting planet, but your main star that you're looking at is this big one and the transiting planet goes around another star in the background. So the depth of that transit is diluted by this big star. So it looks like a tiny transit from a tiny planet and it's actually a really big planet. And so you can get different uh, planet radii and parameters from it. And then you have lots of different flavors of these scenarios. Right, so here comes the very exciting part that uh, clearly I couldn't wait for. And I'm sure you were really excited about as well. <laughs> so this is what the Kepler pipeline produces when it runs its um, TPS algorithm and does some checks. And I'm going to take you through each of the plots, and then you're going to tell me if you think this is a planet. So start looking. So basically, we have a full PDC light curve, so just the full light curve from Kepler for that object. And then over here, the phase uh, full orbit flux. So it's the transit that's been uh, phase folded, but over the entire orbital period. So you can see this object, it has a orbital period of about three days. Then this is the same thing, but centered on the transit. So you can get a good look at the transit. Mm. Over there, we have a little plot that shows you the secondary eclipse. So in reality, I've only shown you this part of what happens when a planet is orbiting its star. But if you have um, a bright planet, so either shining from its own light or reflected light from the star, when it goes behind the star, you're going to be missing some light. So you get a little occultation. Right, so, uh, but it means that the planet is really bright, right? And that maybe it's a star. So it's a little bit of a red flag, but we'll see what you guys think. And then down here we have the transit, so face folded again, but we split the odd and the even transit. Because if you have an occultation, then maybe this, the depths are gonna look slightly different, right? And a uh, white and Space for the transit, so just a noiseless transit, just to get a good look at the shape. And over here we have, this shows you actually where the center of the light from the system that you're looking at falls on the CCD. So for example, in this case, um, you have this big star, but you have this system over there that is emitting quite a lot of light. And as it orbits, uh, as they orbit each other, the centroid, it might be somewhere here and it might be moving. Okay? Whereas if you had a planet just transiting this, star and you didn't have this, um, then most of the light would be centered around here. So it wouldn't move so much. And then finally, you just have some bit parameters. So, okay, who thinks this is a planet? Who thinks this is not a planet? Ooh, there's a lot of contention. <laughs> so actually, <laughs> 
it is a planet, it's a planet candidate. We don't know for sure if it's a planet. So actually all of you guys were right. <laughs> but are there things that someone who thought it, was, it might be a planet uh, wants to point out from the top? Why did you think it was a planet? Okay, it's Monday morning. <laughs> All right, so, well, basically, I mean, the shape of the transit looks pretty rectangular. It doesn't look too V-shaped. And you don't have a secondary eclipse. And these look pretty good. But as I said, it's a planet candidate. So now you have to go and do loads of follow-up. So get, make sure you're looking, you know, the star has the parameters you think it has. And make sure that there isn't another star hidden in the background, but it's looking pretty good from these spots. Right, how about this one now? So we have the same thing. Uh, this, this looks kind of different. This looks, so it, what, what are some red flags here? <laughs> the centroid, yeah, it's all over the place. That looks strange. And what about this? Okay, do you think, do you think this is noise? I mean, there's something here, but it could be a secondary eclipse, right? So who thinks this is a planet? Okay, who thinks this is not a planet? Yeah. So it's probably a background eclipsing binary because, I mean, the centroid is a typical red flag and the shape of the transit is pretty V-shaped. So good job. All right, what about this one? Does the transit shape look, uh, look good to you for a planet? No? Yeah, I, I sent some, uh, some negativity for the planet hypothesis. <laughs> okay, so who, who thinks this is a planet? Okay, who thinks this is not a planet? Okay, no, it's, it's not a planet. I mean, it's probably not. It's very unlikely to be a planet. And I think Tim is going to talk more about these kinds of things in his course. Right. Uh, okay, next. This one. So now I'm messing with you guys because you are all expert um, eyeballers of Kappa data. And this, this one is interesting, right? Because you see it's picked up a transit here, but there's other stuff going on. Um, the secondary eclipse, it looks like there's a secondary eclipse, doesn't it? The odd and even transits are slightly different. The centroid looks good, um, but this definitely looks odd. So does anybody have an idea of what could be going on here? <laughs> okay, Dan. Yes. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so I don't know about the transit timing variations, but definitely multi-planet system. This is actually there must be transit timing variations because it's actually a system. I think it's Kepler thirty C, and the orbital period of that one is sixty days. So there's a planet at thirty days. So this is probably what that is. So excellent observation. Right. Okay. And this is uh, this is it now. You're all you graduated from that exercise. So <laughs> I just want to show you, uh, this is uh, Kepler 452b. And for those of you who've been following the news of Kepler in, in the main news, uh, trying to find the Earth-like planet, this is an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of its star. So it's at just over a year's orbit. And I just wanted to show you this because it looks, this is very difficult, right? I mean, it looks a lot noisier. There are a lot fewer points because it's a much longer orbit. And look at this secondary. It's, it's noisy, right? This is difficult. And look at these odd and even transits. This is very tough. So I just wanted to show you this because this is what the, the 84 parts per million transit depth looks like in Kepler data. So it's doable, but it's getting trickier. Imagine if there were several planets in that system. Right. OK. So uh, now I am through most of the talk. I just want to talk about, say we've done all this exercise and we found these beautiful looking transits and we then went and we 
are assured with all of our follow-up observations that this is a planet. And then moreover, we did some radial velocity observations and we found the reflex motion of the planet and the radial velocity data. And we know this is a planet for sure. It has a mass that is consistent with that of a planet and it all looks great. So what are the steps from there on to characterize your planet? I'm just gonna give you just very briefly what the different steps are. And so we had initially, we did this very rough BLS analysis where we basically found what the global minimum in chi-square was. And from there on, you can do uh, a search, you can basically go look in more detail to find a refined local chi-square minimum or likelihood minimum if you're including um, correlated noise at this stage, although I guess you probably wouldn't be because uh, you might use something like an amoeba method uh, or equivalent. And um, Jason Eastman is going to be telling us about this uh, throughout the week, actually this afternoon and on Friday. And uh, in the uh, XFS uh, tutorial, you're gonna get a flavor of this as well. Uh, and so basically once you have this chi-square minimum, the local minimum, you can go and actually explore the parameter space. So you might have 10, 15 parameters. You might be combining your transit and your radial velocity observations together uh, in a Monte Carlo markup change, chain that explores the parameter space around that minimum. And by doing this exploration, this is not even an optimization anymore. It's an exploration to figure out what the error bars are and what the, the, um, the most likely values uh, estimates are from your data. So it's just to determine the um, uh, parameters, the transit parameters and the error bars associated with them. And so you're going to hear a lot more about this throughout the week. And finally, to wrap up, um, I wanna mention a couple of things that I've said uh, at this point when you're characterizing your planet from your transit data, uh, you might have things that might mess up your results. And so stellar activity stars, <laughs> it's always stars because that's really all you can see when you're looking at a transit, right? Uh, it's an indirect method, really. Uh, so I wanna give a, a very brief um, listing of what stellar activity can be. So uh, the stars vary on time scales uh, from a few minutes. So you have uh, oscillations. Stars have these uh, sound waves that propagate through them and they oscillate and that can create variations in, in luminosity uh, over a, a period of a few minutes. So you might average that out pretty quickly in your observing, but you might, it might create, so you remember we had the, the scatter in the light curve, and a lot of that is due to granulation, and it depends on what kind of star you're looking at as well. Um, and you have, yeah, so you have oscillations and granulation, which both because they act on these short time scales, they contribute to this um, sort of uh, uncorrelated short time scale scatter. So it might be uncorrelated noise. Then you have uh, flares and coronal mass ejections. So basically, these are this is a, a light curve uh, from Spitzer of the Trappist One system, the one that has seven planets transiting. And there's actually some really you can see so you can see all the transits. Uh, this was came out last year, and I'm sure that we all got super excited about it, right? I was excited. And there are some transits where you have like three or four planets transiting at the same time. So can you imagine the shape of that transit? Good luck finding that in the Kepler data. And actually, it was observed by K2. So we have K2 data of Trappist-1. And one of the things about Trappist-1 is that it's an M-dwarf, and M-dwarfs have a lot of flares. And so, for example, this is one during that span. So it's just the, the star erupts and emits a lot of bright stuff that increases the brightness of the star overall. And it lasts over a few minutes to, um, it's mostly a few minutes, maybe up to an hour, overall the whole, the entire signature. On sun-like stars, this is a lot less likely, but then again, if you're looking at thousands of sunlight stars, you might want to be aware of this. There is a lot of literature about flares in Kepler data and others. So I, uh, I have some references in the final slide if you're interested in stellar activity in more detail. Uh, and feel free to come and ask me. This is my favorite part of exoplanets, is the stars. 
And uh, this is actually my favorite part of stellar activity. Um, <laughs> what is on the surfaces of stars, so stars rotate, and a sun-like star rotates with a period of about a month. And you have these dark spots, and you also have bright faculty. And these can create modulation in your star's light curve. Right, so this is correlates the noise. And so you have to be wary of that. And finally, just uh, this is over a long time scale. This is several years. So this is the 11 year cycle of the sun. I just want to point out that the brightness increases throughout the cycle. You see also the rotational modulation. Uh, but you can see your baseline level is going to change. So you might want to be aware of that as well. And this is just a quick example showing you a light curve. And you've got uh, the transit in that and the modulation due to star spots. And what happens is that within the transit, the planet might be occulting a spot. And so you see these little bumps. And if you don't account for these bumps, you might actually find that your transit is shallower than it really is, right? So this could be biasing your planet radius. And if you had some spots that were like in tricky parts, like at the ingress or the egress, then you might even mess up uh, your orbital period or your phase or other things. So you gotta watch out for occulted spots uh, and also for unocculted spots because they will change the baseline level of the star as you can see in this figure up there. Right, and then finally, uh, just last point, know thy star, know thy planet. Uh, <laughs> I'm done. But basically, if you have a star and you have a planet and you revise your stellar radius and you find the star is actually bigger, the planet is bigger too. So you've really got to be sure that you've measured your stellar parameters accurately. And uh, Alessandro Sozzetti is going to talk about uh, Gaia on Thursday. And uh, he's going to be telling us, uh, hopefully, about how uh, Gaia is providing us much more accurate stellar parameters and how this feeds into transit uh, analyses. Right, so this is it from me. Uh, I'm going to leave my conclusions up. Basically, you have to observe a lot of stars if you want to find some transit. And if you want to look for smaller planets, I would suggest looking, well, there are lots of surveys that look at smaller stars as well. And it takes a lot of time and human effort and resources to find planets. So for ground-based surveys, Typically, from the moment you find a planet candidate, like a transit, you have only about one or 2% of these are actually gonna be planets. For Kepler, it's a lot less, uh, it's a lot better. So the success rate is about 15% uh, because there are many more steps involved and we're gonna hear a lot more about that uh, this afternoon. Uh, and know thy star, know thy planet. All right. Okay, questions. Uh, does Kepler have pipelines for detecting variability of? Uh, yes, I'm sure it does. Well, so the PDC, uh, the preconditioning uh, light curve has preserves a lot of the stellar variability, but it does, once you go into details, you do have to look at the, at the details because there are some periodicities. Uh, for example, we had a, a few systems where we weren't sure we had a periodicity at about 15 days and, and it wasn't clear if it was stellar variability or if that was just a, a systematic introduced uh, from the, condition, the um, reduction of the light curve. Um, but I can, we can, talk more about it, I can give you some pointers for that. Well, I can point you to people who know much better than me. <laughs> In the back. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, the, basically, the, 
test trans, uh, pixels are going to be a lot bigger than the Kepler uh, pixels. And so, yes, there are going to be probably a lot more uh, false positives because just we're less able to resolve which star, if there are several stars in that pixel, there are probably, it's more likely there are going to be more stars in, in one pixel. So I would say that ground-based follow-up is going to be really important there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to take more work than Kepler, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, basically, if you don't know the distance of a star very well, you might not be able to to say if it's a giant or if it's just uh, a small uh, dwarf uh, star. And this is where Gaia is, again, going to be a lifesaver because we're going to be able to sort all this out straight away by just knowing the distances of the stars. And that's going to save us a lot of follow-up. Do star systems have uh, preferences in, in orientation with respect to the galactic plane? Uh, as far as I, I, I don't think so, but maybe someone knows? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't think so. Is it, do you, uh, so do you summarize it? <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, do, do stars uh, have, uh, shall just have preferred orientations with respect to the galactic plane? That, that's a big question. <laughs> I always thought the answer to that was no, but okay. So we had another question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Would a Venus-type planet cause a secondary eclipse? Uh, I mean, I guess it would, but it would be really, really small. It all depends on what your precision is uh, in your, your instrumental precision and your cadence as well. Um, because Venus is going to reflect some of the light of the, the, of the sunlight, but depending on its atmosphere properties, it might not. Well, it has a, a strong albedo. You might see phase variations. You might see phase variations, yeah. Okay. Is there one more over here? Yep. Last one. Yeah, uh, how can you discriminate between a uh, background eclipsing star or a background eclipsing planet around another star? Uh, I would say that the transit shape would be slightly different because uh, typically when you've got stars transiting stars, you have this very, this V shape uh, just because you have, um, because the, plan the star is, is, the transiting object is pretty big compared to the primary object. So you get like the ingress and the egress mostly. Um, but there are, I mean, this is, this was a very simplified uh, example. There are, there are loads of things you can look at. It's, it's a combination of, if you're interested, I'm sure there are loads of ground-based transit surveys that would love to have you do lots of eyeballing for them. <laughs> okay, we need to move on. So let's thank Raphael again.